Thank you. <clears throat> I have uh, my honey tea, and hopefully my uh, cough's going to behave. Uh, but thank you, Tapestry, for having me. Um, and uh, I today I'm going to be uh, talking about why I'm so into getting all emotional about statistics. Uh, and I'll be also um, making an argument that as a society that aims to be uh, science-driven uh, or uh, facts and information-driven, but also um, a democracy, that it's really in our best interest to become more comfortable with talking about statistics uh, emotionally. Uh, and so, uh, so as for storytelling, uh, and to, to kind of piggyback off of what some of Michelle was talking about, there are some advantages to using emotion uh, when talking about numbers, uh, and one of them has to do with memory retention. And there's a lot of research that looks at, uh, you know, when, our, when we're at a higher emotional state, when we form memories, uh, it shows that we're more likely to retain them. Um, and so just to give you an example of the kind of research they do on this, um, so for example, one study, uh, subjects will look at a slide while the, uh, the, the people doing the test will read some sort of narration. And by random, uh, some of the subjects will hear narration that ha is slightly emotionally enhanced. And those that, that receive that version of the slides tend to have a better retention of the image on the slide. Right? Um, but there is also a danger to working uh, with emotion because there are also studies that show that when you bring emotion into an equation, there is a uh, kind of a heightened focus on, on the emotional stimulus and sometimes to the, at the cost of, of understanding other things. So a very emotional movie, for example, people will remember the characters better, but maybe not the plot as much. Now to come back to that when we talk about uh, using kind of personal anecdotes as the source of your emotion and some of the dangers with that. Um, and, and so the weapons focus effect is kind of, is, in terms of uh, what that means is that when, when investigators are, are interviewing uh, uh, witnesses of a crime, as soon as the gun or the knife comes out, the witnesses will just you know, have a great memory of that knife and the gun, but those, they, they, their memories of what people are wearing actually fades away. So emotion can be a very dangerous thing to work with too when you're, when you're dealing with uh, memory. Uh, and then, uh, is for, again, is in terms of a practical advantage as far as making more marketable content, uh, emotional stories tend to be more lurid. And a very kind of cheap way of, of showing that is to just look at the way folks uh, advertise movies. And so previews are often trying to convince you in one way or the other that this experience is going to be highly emotional. So not necessarily happiness, but, but you'll be scared, you'll be aroused, you'll uh, uh, see things blowing up, whatever. Uh, but, uh, and so, and actually it's funny, as I, as I was putting the slide together and getting bored of downloading movie posters, I took a quick Twitter check, and without even thinking about it, I clicked on this tweet. It says, get ready to cry, watch this ad from Denmark. And I didn't, I didn't realize until, you know, coming back with that I was such a chump that I kind of proved my own point. But, so it's, it's not just, um, yeah, so the question is, this is, we're talking about movies, entertainment, is it appropriate to, to kind of use emotion in this way with uh, data-driven stories? And that's something I'm, I'm going to be getting into. Uh, and then you can go on and, and talk about other advantages to using emotion and, and this question of, does it make more persuasive arguments? Are we more likely to share stories that are emotional, to kind of share the emotion with our, with our friends online? Um, but these, I don't want to spend um, any more time on these kind of arguments. I want to dig a little deeper into this question of, of emotion and numbers. Um, and there are a lot of emotions to talk about, uh, but with my work, especially that focuses on, on war statistics, uh, I'm gonna be looking at just the human loss and the emo emotional intensity. So how badly we feel when we see bad things happening to people. Uh, and when you're talking about individual stories, so either fictional or nonfiction, there is this connection between what happens to a subject and how we, we feel about it. Just like in our own lives, something that's less serious that happens to us, we, we don't feel as, as badly about it, but if you go through a major tragedy, we lose a loved one. 
uh, suffer an injury, we feel worse about it. And through the magic of empathy, uh, that connection is there when you, when you read about folks at the individual level. Um, and it's somewhat predictable. So if, you're, if you see someone reading a book um, and they're really upset and they're crying, you can guess that they're reading about something serious that someone experienced a loss, a serious loss. And it'd be strange if they said, you know, you know, the character spilled coffee on his pants and it was really hot and he'd be late for work. You know, it'd be, so, and so it sounds really obvious. This is a really obvious statement, but I just want to kind of remark on how wonderful of a thing it is when what we feel has some kind of a connection to what's happening to people. Um, and, and it's not a connection we should take for granted because as you increase the amount of human loss and you go from one to many people, that connection between what we feel and what's happening to people goes away. And we can get into, does that go away completely? Um, so, so my personal view is that it does. Uh, we can play games with relative values. Uh, uh, and, but, but a lot of the research, for example, shows that we have a, a greater emotional uh, response to individual stories than statistics. Um, and there are a lot of different models um, and analogies people use to, to try to kind of figure out how, what our brains do, do emotionally with, with numbers. The analogy that, that, I, uh, that I like because it's kind of so simple and explains everything is just to say that that even when you're dealing with the story of an individual, uh, there's some kind of a, an upper bound or a maximum for, for how much we can care about a stranger. And it sounds cold, but, but uh, even, even if, that per, if that person goes through a ter terrible loss, you're not gonna feel as badly as, as they, they feel, right? And so uh, that whatever, whatever, as a storyteller, however much you can, you can however emotion you can get, that doesn't scale. So you can't say to someone, I know you feel terrible about this person, now multiply that by 500 or 10 million. You know, if, if you could, the person would pass out you know, or suffer long-term trauma. Um, and, so, uh, and so I guess one, one way you can kind of look at it is to kind of talk about it as, as you have a, 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 let's say a, a maximum of your chart, right? So here's a, a, a graph of, of people who have HIV in Africa and we're showing that oh shoot, we ran out of space to fit in Sub-Saharan Africa, so you have to kind of squeeze everything down to kind of, you have to care less about everybody to kind of fit it on, on, on your emotional spectrum. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying it, it, it works that way, or how, I don't know how the brain works, but I, I do think we can say with certainty that when there are more people involved, we care about each individual less. Like, we can say that with some certainty. Uh, <clears throat> but then you can play all these games with relative value, so, so we do, tend to have a, a stronger emotional response to, to bigger numbers. And, and, I, and I found that if you stress that a number is really big, you know, folks will feel that more. Um, but what the actual numbers are, that's the thing that seems to matter the least, whereas it should matter the most. Um, and so there isn't any kind of a grounding as to how we feel and, 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 and the amount of loss. Um, and, and often another thing you sometimes find is that if you, if you find out, for example, that the number of people who died in, in the war in Syria is, you know, twice as what you thought it was, that doesn't necessarily change your response. Or, or if you find out it was half, you don't think, oh great, so many people's lives were saved. Um, even though we think that it's the, the size of the conflict in Syria which makes us feel so upset about it. We think that it's the size, that, but, but so many cases, we, we don't have that connection. Um, so every time I'm lucky enough to talk on, on stage, I'll always bring up this book, because it's my favorite book. And, uh, and Steven Pinker, in uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, at one point he looks at uh, <clears throat> a lot of conflict data and uh, the number of conflicts and the size of conflicts. And he found that <clears throat> uh, when you plot uh, all the conflicts we know about, they follow a power law distribution. Right? And so this is mathy, but I want to kind of explain a little bit about what a power law distribution means. Um, so other things follow this, this pattern. And one of the examples he gave is this, uh, the size of cities, right? So going to, on the bottom, going to the right, cities get bigger. Uh, and then on the, 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 the vertical axis, 
shows you how many of them there are, right? <clears throat> so there are tons and tons of little cities. If you look it up at a map, there are tons of cities that don't have a lot of people in them. Uh, but this chart uh, ends at you know, half a million. And as you know, there are a lot of really big cities, and so it kind of goes shooting off that way. So there, it's rare for a city to get really big. But when a city does get big, it tends to get really big, right? And the, what the gray part of the chart shows is if you were to take that access, axis and put it on a logarithmic scale, so now the hatches go 10,000, 100,000, a million, that, that, that same line becomes remarkably straight, like strangely straight. Uh, now with cities, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that they would follow this pattern in a way because as cities get bigger, they become more big because of the fact that they're big, right? So you're more likely to, to move to Los Angeles or New York because there's so many people there than a random city. Uh, and so, so Pinker pointed out that conflicts follow this, that same straight line. And, and here we have, it's, it's on both ends, it's a, it's a logarithmic scale. So it's rare for a war to get very big. But when a war gets big, it can get really, really big. And the reason that wars, one of the reasons he puts forward that, that wars do this is different than the reason cities grow in this way. And it has more to do with this thing up here, with not having any kind of a, a, a sense of, of human life or, or, or a grounding of life to numbers with, with regards to the, how the leaders think about their, their, their casualties. So he points out that, that, the, uh, that the number of, of soldiers that a, 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 a leader is willing to commit has to do with how many they've already committed. Um, and so in, in a lot of these kind of most bloody wars, like World War II, um, and even in, at the end of Vietnam, this uh, the, the, it's irrational loss aversion strategy. So these leaders are just kind of sending soldiers to their deaths to the point where you're not even sure what, what it is you're, you're accomplishing at this point. Um, and, so, and so this, this the straight line can be explained if you say that the, 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 the leaders are willing to commit more as a percentage of what they've already committed. Right. Um, and then, I, I, I'm sure there's some data stories, podcast uh, fans, but this, this was talked about a little bit with uh, a, a Paul Slovic episode, and he talked about how this kind of perception of numbers is also kind of uh, follows the way we perceive other things, like lights in a room and this Weber's law. So we will we'll notice the difference between one light going on and two, but the difference between 100 and one, we may not even notice it. So it all becomes kind of relative. So the, so the point of all this ramble about this <coughs> uh, parallel distribution is that this whole thing about not really being able to process numbers or, or not being able to really fully understand them isn't just some thing, you know, a heady philosophical issue. This has painted a picture of some of the worst things we, we've done to each other. Um, and, and, as, and I don't think it's overdramatic to say that it has caused millions of people to needlessly die because of the fact that we lose this connection, this emotional connection to the numbers. Uh, so you could say, well, if, if we're so terrible at numbers, how come we are able to do all these amazing things, right? So we're able to send people to space and make uh, incredible works of, of architecture and um, put supercomputers slash GPS slash cameras in our pockets. Um, and in terms of counting dead people, we're able to not only accurately count people who've died, but predict who, how many people are gonna die in various categories the next year. So we're not bad at numbers, we're amazing at, at numbers, right? And so the, the kind of the answer to this question of this duality of being bad and good at numbers, um, I'm gonna kind of mash together uh, uh, two uh, very general ideas. So, so the one is to say that while uh, it's important to acknowledge that we have all these limitations, that we're wired certain ways, um, or we evolved in a different world than we live in today, we all humans have this very rich tradition of <coughs> overcoming our limitations, right? So and especially again to old technology, you know, it's hard to know where, where's our natural limitation and, and, uh, and Where's the tool? So we, we, how are we hunters with no claws or teeth? But you add the spear. Um, you know, how can are we Arctic dwellers without any fur? Um, and so the idea being that even if we have limitations, we've figured out how to overcome them, right? Um, 
And then the other kind of idea to mash in is, is this idea that there's a difference between just kind of thinking on your feet and sitting down and, and, and working out a problem, this kind of slow thinking, fast thinking idea. Um, and so there's, a, and by the way, <laughs> I know I'm going on a very long rant. I'm, I'm getting to an argument about emotion eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I should have warned you ahead of time. Uh, sorry about this, uh, but I'm getting there. Um, so but, but let's just talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, Kahneman's book and this distinction between fast thinking and slow thinking, right? So, um, so he kind of points out that in an example like this, you see somebody's face. There are so many thoughts that come to your mind that you can't even help it, and, and, they, ha and they happen quickly, and they're very emotional. So, you have all these thoughts about who she is, the color of her hair, what she's going to say, you know, the, the look at her expression on her eyes. Oops, excuse me. But, um, <clears throat> but that's a di very different thing than if you're looking at this multiplication problem, 17 times 27. Yeah, you'll have some initial quick reaction to that, but it's a very different kind of thinking when you sit down and you, and you work it out, right? And you actually slowly process the numbers, right? And, and, and the book gets... Uh, confuses me, or sorry, it gets really into this question of fast versus slow, and, and when does each thing kick in? And, and, and so sometimes you'll see kind of contradicting ideas. So in the case of sympathy, you know, in the book you're saying that here's an example of him having to overcome his initial fast reaction to feel sympathy for someone using his slower thinking. And then, but then I saw an article last week where someone was saying sympathy is actually something you have to develop, to, and it's a slow. And I'm just gonna kind of skip all this because it, it, it overly complicates my argument. Um, and, and just kind of look at the areas where this fast and slow is very easy to discern the difference of, right? So, and one of the examples uh, that I really liked was the one that, that Saul gave in that po uh, sto uh, Data Stories podcast, where he, he says that if you, if you approach um, a creek and you're in, 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 in nature, um, and you have to make decisions about, can I drink this water, right? And that question is, something that you make quickly and intuitively, and it's very emotional, right? So you say that water is ick gross, right? Can I cross this swamp? And, it, and it's a very emotional, quick thinking. You know, ah, snake. Um, and, it's, and so it is thinking, but it's very emotional thinking, right? Uh, and that's very different than taking a sample of water, running a test on it, and finding out whether you can drink it. Right. So where I'm going with all this is that if we're going to take these two columns of thought, um, the slow thinking and the fast thinking, we're going to acknowledge that in both cases we have a natural problem with numbers. Right? We just aren't very good at them. We don't come out of the womb knowing how to do math. Um, but in the case of slow thinking, we have uh, figured out all sorts of ways of overcoming our weakness, right? So everything from, this is a, an old measuring rod from the Egyptians, and we've, in, in, in algebra, and in, in geometry, and mathematics, and help things to help us make calculations, and, and computers. Um, and, and data visualization is a huge thing in, in the slow thinking category, and spreadsheets. Uh, and even some of these kind of most celebrated data visualization examples are much more in this kind of slow thinking examples by scientists trying to figure out, see patterns in the world. Um, and then you could kind of say that, wrap this all up in this kind of scientific uh, process and the enlightenment and everything. Um, but the, so the argument I'm arriving at is that I think it's fair to say that we're doing a pretty good job on, on the slow thinking category in terms of overcoming our, our weaknesses with numbers. And while there are definitely a lot of areas where we're, we can improve our methods, it's this cell on the table uh, that like, I want to just live in and, and do anything I can to contribute to. How do we overcome these weaknesses we have with numbers in this category of, uh, of emotional and more rapid thinking? And so when the public uh, reads the news stories or when we learn about the world without kind of digging into it as scientists, Usually, fast thinking is all that we're, we're going to give. The, that's, that's all the public's going to give it, right? And and, and and I say public, I should also say a lot of leaders too, right? Especially leaders that read or watch the news for, for their for their uh, intel. Um, so, and so, um, I just wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about kind of my, my thoughts on on uh, this 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 say if you're going to frame it this way, as as I frame it in in, in my head, like. Uh, what are some things we can think about for in terms of 
the importance of, of what tools we have or develop to overcome our limitations in our, in our fast thinking, um, and what are some of the problems. And, and so I, I feel that uh, even though a lot of folks who are into data visualization or into data-driven stories really want to be uh, doing work that's focusing on, on the general public and in theory on this kind of more quick reactions, I think that a lot of us are, are really uncomfortable with this question of emotion. And, and fast thinking is very emotional thinking. And I think we even frame this question of, of, of using our heads versus using our, our guts or, or, using, or, or the heart versus head as almost like the problem with our society. We say if only we would, uh, you know, if we wouldn't have voted a certain way if people were using their heads instead of using their emotions. Um, and, and there's a lot of good reason to, to, to feel that way. And a lot of folks uh, who, who tell, uh, who use emotion do it in, in lieu of facts. I think of political ads and political messages that are you know, not factual and they're using emotion as a persuasive uh, instrument. Um, and that gives it kind of a, a bad reputation. But uh, what I'm gonna be arguing is, is that uh, if, you, if you kind of embrace the idea that when you're emotional about things that are factual and true, there isn't anything wrong with that and you're not being deceptive and you're not being coercive in a negative way. Um, but uh, the other thing, the, the problem though in terms of what our goal is, is as, as uh, talking earlier about this problem with our inability to uh, kind of have a sense of, of emotional proportion to what the numbers are, is that we can't overcome that. So there's never gonna be a source of, of truth uh, from our emotions when it comes to the statistics, right? Um, so the truth is always gonna have to come from the slow thinking side. Um, and so one way to kind of look at it <laughs> is to say that, that while so much of the, the scientific process is to kind of figure out how do we not let our emotions and our biases uh, screw up the data and not let us see the truth, that there's, the, there's a, there's a, there's a step after we've found the truth, which is to kind of put the emotions back in uh, and to put the humanity back into the numbers. Uh, and, uh, and so in other words, sliding things over here uh, and, and telling the stories, even though they're, they're science driven and they're fact driven, but, but being comfortable uh, talking about the, the, the kind of the emotional connection, the human connection to things. So um, with that long winded argument, I do wanna now kind of shift gears and, and, and talk about uh, some of the, 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 kind of, the kind of thinking I do to how do you approach uh, to kind of emotional driven storytelling and talk about some of the inspirational uh, pieces of work that, that I love and I wanna kind of talk about. Uh, uh, one thing I'll say is that to me, um, this problem of how do you make statistics interesting and emotional uh, I think that the, the, the status quo, the, 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 the number one thing you often hear people say uh, is the way to do it is to focus on the individual stories. Um, and there's absolutely a, a tremendous amount of truth to that. Uh, and I would never want to discount the importance of telling individual stories. Uh, but I do have a, a problem with um, relying on individual stories as, 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 the, as the only source of emotion. So, Going even, even back to that, that the story about the memories, if, if, if the focus, if all the, if all the uh, emotional source comes from uh, just you know, the individual story, does that mean that we're also gonna have that memory and that connection to the data that that's al goes along with it? And, 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 I'll, and I'll show some examples, not necessarily. So to me, the, 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 the um, let me actually tell a story. So the, the first, um, Project I ever did was as a student in 2002, and it was uh, a documentary about AIDS in Africa. And I created a website, uh, and I also did a documentary that looked at some of the people behind the numbers. And and I was told by someone who had a, a lot of experience in media that, hey, listen, these charts you're doing about all these facts and fingers are great and all but you're not gonna get people to care about this issue unless you tell the human stories, right? And that's this advice I was given. It's good advice, it's, it's, it's advice that's, that's driven by uh, you know, a lot of research, but I hated that advice because you know, I 
was drawn to AIDS in Africa for the same reason I was drawn to World War, War II because it's this enormous human crisis. And the idea, and you can tell a human story about a crisis of any size and tell a very compelling story. Um, and so the idea that all the emotion has to come from the individual stories, which isn't tied to what the larger story is, is something I had real trouble with, right? And so in some ways, the, the fall in World War II was 10 years later, my stubborn answer to that advice saying, screw you, it doesn't, you don't have to rely on the individual stories in order to tell that kind of emotional story. And so, yeah, you can definitely kind of, uh, you know, occasionally zoom in and, and, and find ways of, of combining the two. Uh, but I think there's a real, uh, anyway, as, as a goal would, should be to how do, you, how do you draw the emotion without over-reliance on the individual stories. Um, and so, I know this is a, a very boring example to bring up because the piece is amazing, and I know most of you have seen it, and, and, and Kim uh, uh, spoke here at this conference in the past. Um, and I, I'm not gonna like play with the sound, I'm gonna kinda talk over it uh, because, because of that. But one thing I, I, I just love about this is that I love playing it for folks who haven't seen it before, and uh, watching the audience watch this piece, and seeing folks gazing at data and be moved, emotionally moved in a very uh, short period of time. And, 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 the, and it does tease out individual stories, but that's not where, that's not where the source of the emotion is. The, the, the power comes from, from the whole when, when you see it. Um, the problem, <coughs> uh, I feel, with this piece in terms of a learning tool is that it's so elegant uh, so sophisticated that if you say to the folks, you know, we want to get emotional with data, so we want to do something like this, you know, people will be like, yeah, we'll, we'll get to work on that. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so I feel like, uh, well, I, I, so, I, so, so Hans Rosling and, and is, is another, I mean, actually, let's escape out of this. Is, I find it a little easier to talk about in terms of a, a source of inspiration for emotion because you can kind of see him do it. And, and I know uh, a lot of folks are talking about all the different things they love about Hans Rosling these days. Um, and so I just want to just think about it just in terms of the, the emotional side first. And it's to say that the fact that, so the, the, the dots that are on, on the screen, they're not individual stories, but the fact that Hans has this emotional connection to what they represent, the people that represent, is evident in the way he's, he's talking about it. And so, when, so when the numbers improve, it, it, it makes him happy, right? And, and as you watch it, uh, that happiness that he feels for progress uh, kind of it hits you too, you know? And, and so I, th I think that's a kind of this, this lovely model because one of the ways to, if you're, if you're saying, okay, listen, you're talking about getting emotional about data stories, it's kind of, you know, how do I approach that? One way to, to, to start is just to say, what is my emotional connection to this information? Do I feel something about this? Um, it could be about global warming, it could be about healthcare, there, there, there are human stories behind this. And, and if I first just kind of let myself feel this, uh, Perhaps that can be kind of passed on to, to the audience. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, and so a model, and so I'm not a musician, uh, uh, but one thing, uh, occasionally I like to kind of st strike some notes on a piano. And, 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 and music is this amazing thing because it has this almost immediate emotional resonance. And it's, it's, and the cool thing, and, and again, I'm stating a lot of obvious facts here, but the cool thing is that is that if you strike a few notes and you feel something and you go just to somebody else and you play those, so, those notes, there's a good chance that person's gonna feel the same thing, right? Um, and so one way of approaching emotion is to actually go inward. And, 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 and again, the, the Hans Rossing example is to really, uh, and this is, maybe it doesn't sound scientific because you're, you're always talking about what, you know, viewing it from the audience standpoint. But sometimes if you allow yourself to, to build a piece that you have an emotional connection with, that you're, you know, so as you're making a movie, this makes me feel something because I, I feel something about this, this data. 
something really cool would happen because that you play it to someone else and they, and they may feel those, those same feelings. And the other thing, uh, to, to kind of go back to the swamp example, is that uh, well, there's a lot of talk about empathy, <clears throat> but with emotions, uh, even, if, even if we're kind of bounded by how much you can feel about strangers, for example, there are so many different kinds of emotions. So there are so many different feelings that come uh, from uh, thinking about things in different ways. Uh, and using, using the swamp example, all the different kinds of emotions that come from the swamp. So uh, even, if you're not, even if you're not gonna be able to necessarily line up how you feel with the numbers of people, you can take advantage of the fact that, uh, <coughs> let me just give you an example. So I have this memory when I was younger of, of my parents playing uh, Gandhi, the 1980-something Kingsley version, and they didn't realize that there's a scene that, that happened with this massacre. Um, and suddenly, it was kind of, I was kind of scurried out of, out of the room where I, or, or it was paused or something. And I'll just never forget seeing, and, you know, glimpses of this. And as, and as a, you know, I, I've seen people killed on TV before. I've seen lots of Westerns and everything else. But seeing a mass killing was this incredibly emotional uh, experience for me, and it, and it shook me up because a mass killing feels different, you know. And then, or, or, or talking about nuclear war, the, 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 there's there's feelings that come from different size events that actually have different feelings that you can draw from without always focusing on empathy, empathy, empathy. Um, uh, and, and in some ways, I, I also kind of like to think about uh, the fact that. Even though there's a lot of examples of how individual stories are more powerful in that sometimes smaller has a more, uh, a stronger emotional resonance, there are also cases where bigger gives a, a bigger emotional resonance. And, and, and so, uh, so when you look at a rock formation in nature, it can give, you can see the beauty, you can feel something from that. Um, but if it's bigger, it can be more powerful. Um, and so, uh, a lot, and so a lot of artists have kind of, kind of draw from the fact that, that there's, there's feelings and making things feel big. Um, and, and, so, and, and so a lot of kind of when I'm, I'm doing work, I'm, a lot of that kind of is focused on this idea that how do you make things you know, feel big? Um, and there is, a, I think, there's a, a, a trend in, in data visualization to have things uh, very minimalistic, a lot of white space, and very, and, 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 and so sometimes you have to wonder, is, are you, am, I, am I doing this because of, of the, the visual trends, um, or is this because uh, this really is gonna kind of give the most powerful resonance to, to the audience is, is, is a question I, I recommend you ask. Um, and an, an example of folks who, who just do an incredible job in so many areas, and this is, is New York Times, and, and this, uh, this uh, piece on, on Syria, and so each of the red dots is, is, a, is a victim of the, the war in Syria. And so it is elegant, but it is also um, messy, right? And, and so it, you, can, you can find combinations of, of keeping things messy to make them feel bigger without giving up on kind of that design elegance. Uh, and this is another New York Times example I just wanted to point out because <clears throat> uh, here you have a focus on an individual story which is fine, and you can definitely do that, but they don't, they don't rely on that alone for the, em the emotion, right? So this is about uh, this, 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 cri this mecha crush. So they also use these same kind of, this uh, dot visual to kind of show the number of people and where they came from in this tragedy. <coughs> uh, so again, so I, the point isn't, isn't to dispel from using individual stories, just don't, not to use them uh, Oh, uh, and nothing, and not the not the motion about the numbers. <clears throat> um, and then I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, interactivity. How much how much time do we have? <laughs> Fifteen minutes of, of of talking or of, of as much as you want. We'll give you two minutes. Right? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I'll say that when I started the, the fall of World War II, uh, 
I, I'm a web developer and I'm a coder, and so I kind of think that the things I want to make are going to be inter interactive. Um, and and so originally it was intended to be more of a of a of a timeline with a small introduction, and, and it just kind of kept growing uh, from there until the interactive piece of it became you know the the, the small bit. Um, <coughs> And so let me first <coughs> just kind of point out that, of course, there are so many really great uses of interactivity. So if, 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 if the audience is searching for something, if uh, you know, great examples of, of people taking information and making it personal, like what are my local hospitals like, the idea of, of, of dig allowing them to dig deeper after a presentation, and other kind of special cases and <coughs> ideas, and that's, excuse me, uh, great. I, I, just, I'm, I guess I'm going to be make, making a case against the base case, which is when you are uh, presenting uh, information to folks and, you, and your findings, um, and it doesn't fall into one of these categories. You're just making the best presentation you can uh, of, of the data or, or the story. Uh, and there are just, and also just to get this stuff out of the way, there are, there are problems with interactivity in mobile devices, right? You can't. It's 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 just it's a very it's a headache to deal with. Um, I, I if I see something on interactive on my phone, I don't I probably don't want to start tapping at something, um, uh, and and embedding it in social media. So again, for me, having coming from the web world and having to deal with all these things, when I made a YouTube video and I just uploaded it to YouTube and it just works for everything, it's just it was the most amazing thing. Um, <laughs> and so there is something about video stories that just kind of work with the, the social mobile world we live in, right? So there's, some, there's kind of these, again, practical reasons, reasons for against interactivity there too. But the thing is, is that um, one of the things as I was working at, I found is that <coughs> I would go to, I'd oftentimes go to a conference where I'd see someone present work um, and be, be totally blown away by the work they, the, the, the artist presented. Uh, and then, I would see that work in its native environment on, on my computer, and the experience was often not as great. It, 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 and, and, I, and, I've, and I felt like I missed, I was missing the author. Um, I was feeling that I'm probably not clicking on it as well as, as he or she would have, uh, that my time is, is precious, and I'm not creating the, the ultimate experience for, uh, for myself, right? Um, and so I, I kind of created this, this, this rule that I always ask myself when I'm creating something, which is to say, just when I'm making something, would it be better if I was there presenting it to the, to the, to the audience? And if so, then just do that, right? I mean, or make a video of yourself presenting it. Because I, I find all this digital stuff very confusing. But if you can reduce it to a question, which is which is better, do the thing that's better, right? <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> so, and there's, and there's this thing called interactive documentaries, just more in the film world that I love. And, uh, and so what they sometimes do is they, 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 have it, they have an interactive documentary kind of shown like you're at a, at a film festival. You come into this dark room, yet the, the, the filmmaker is there, like, steering it on, I know. You're watching him or her steer the, 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 the film. And it, it actually works out pretty well. And, and so I started going through some of these interactive documentaries and thinking to myself, geez, I... This is pretty cool, but I wish I could have seen the person present it on stage. And so I was, I was like, I want a non-interactive version of an interactive thing, a non-interactive version. And so, and so this, this, this is this thing that I kept kind of thinking about as I was working on, on, the, on the Fallen, is that there seems to be this overvaluation of interactivity. And so if we just kind of think about linear, you know, we, we, there's been a lot of talk about in this conference so far about these kind of linear sequential stories. Uh, if you think about stories that are linear in the non-digital world, you know, <laughs> sometimes when people make these blanket attacks on, oh, l linear storytelling is so old school, and I think, you're dissing like the written language, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so all these forms of, of expression, you know, it, it, it has an introduction, it has the end. Um, and, and I also often feel that there's this, this connection in terms of the author and the audience where you're, you're, you're moving in, in time together. Even when you're reading a book, even if it's not a time-based piece, you're moving in time together and you feel that the author is there with you and the author is thinking about 
you know, how, was I inter how did I introduce this material? I am I going on too long? Am I getting boring? It, it, you get this feeling that the author is caring about your experience. And when something's interactive, it is, it is something about it which is a little bit inhospitable. It's just like, there you go, craft your own experience. I'm sure it'll be great. Um, and, and so in a lot of these cases of these, these, um, these kind of non-digital linear forms of expression, so if you went to a, uh, this is another analogy I have in my head, is if you went to a, a lecture hall, <coughs> you, the, the professor could make it more interactive. He, you know, you could lay out all the, the photos and articles on a table and say, hey, you know, explore this on your own, and I'm here for questions. But you'd probably say, hey, I, I'd actually rather you present this in the best possible way for me. You know, I'd rather you, um, you, you, know, you, cr you craft my experience. And so that's, that's my rant on against interactivity. Um, and that really comes to the end of my, 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 my talk here. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, I think we have a really important job to do as a society, in our society, but the kind of this, this, this argument I'm making is that we're, we're kind of hindering our, our work with, in two of our, uh, with our own devices, which is that I feel like we're uh, overly uncomfortable with emotion because we associate it with um, non-scientific thinking um, and we overvalue uh, interactivity, and that's kind of my, my closing statement. <laughs> All right, questions. Hi, that, that really closely mirrors my experience running Kill and doing interactive storytelling for the last few years. And we have always tried to inject emotion, for example, with music, which is something that you almost you very rarely get outside of straightforward video, um, but can be incorporated um, into web content. Um, but with the particular question of like the interactivity, you know, should, sh is it better if someone stood in front of you presenting it? The way that we, over the years, developed to deal with that was that we made it possible to upload audio files and basically have them do the presenting for you. And they effectively right. click the buttons. And we released an open source library to do this called Talkie. And what it allows you to do is to basically link time codes in your, in your explanation, or it can even be a video if you, if you want to be visible on the screen. Um, and it basically presses the buttons for you, and it does exactly what, um, it tries to square the circle uh, right. exactly the way you were describing. And, and for us, the reason that's really good is that, um, well, there's a bunch of reasons. One, it, in a way, it's more mobile friendly than a video, because a web app plus an audio file is much lighter to download than a big audio file. So you get right. a really perfectly high quality thing on your phone. Right. Um, and secondly, it's, um, it, 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 it just gives you the, it means you don't have to compromise. You get the interactivity for exploring, but you get the, the, uh, the, the narrative for storytelling. Yeah, and, and have you found, uh, in terms of any analytics on do, do how many folks li listen to the audio version and then continue to explore, or how many of them choose not yeah, to use it? Yeah, what we've found is that <coughs> if you put a big play button in the middle of an interactive, then almost 100% of people right. come straight on and click the play button. Right, right. And then almost everyone who clicks play, as long as you keep it below about two minutes, almost everyone who clicks play will get through to the end, and then the, about two thirds of them will drop off, and about a third will stay and then explore. So you're kind of serving both 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 needs. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I found too, and, and I think it's a great that's it's a great uh, way of, of of solving it, you know. Um, and and I found with with the the fallen piece, uh, even though I made this interactive thing, the vast majority of views were from a folks embedding it on on news sites. So I, th I think there are like nine million views of people not even on my website, watching it on Slate or something else, uh, such a small percentage of people actually experience the interactive version of it. Uh, so it's not, in that case, it wasn't just the fact that people just wanted to, you know, they, they don't want to work, they just want to hit the play button, and, and, and it was also, it, it is founding that, you know, it, it is how it, again, it's the idea of how it, how it works in this world where there aren't actually home pages, that everything is on another, you know, it's on a Facebook page, it's on a news, there isn't like a, this, this, this kind of embeddability I found to be really big in terms of, of getting more eyeballs on something. Um, and so, yes, that was, the, that was the other piece of it for, for our own numbers. Hi, Neil. Um, hey. Thanks a lot for this uh, very inspiring talk. And uh, I was particularly interested in the part on, on emotion 
and I was looking back at the, <laughs> the screenshot that I took of your, of your grid where you have fast thinking, public, and slow thinking experts, and you have this big gap there. And I have to say, I've been thinking along similar lines for a while. When I, uh, when I discovered Paul, Paul Slovak's works for the first time, I was like, oh my God, we, we are not doing this thing right. <laughs> right. And, uh, but at the same time, it's kind of like we are, I don't know, I see, there, to me it looks like there is a, li a little bit of a paradox there. Because on the one hand, we want, at least that's the way I see it. On the one hand, I want to find a way to encourage people to think rationally about problems. And we desperately need that. We need to find ways to have more people think rationally about problems, right? But on the other hand, if we just use numbers or, or charts, they won't um, attend to this information and they won't even try, right? All right. So then, um, what's the solution? I don't know, maybe we need more emotion, right? Maybe we should use one data point rather than n data points, right? But then as soon as you do that, then you have another problem, right? So <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know. I'm wondering if you have more <laughs> thoughts on how, if you see the same paradox and uh, um, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think, I, yeah, I, 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 again, I, I don't, I feel, I wanted to kind of leave it as a blank space too because I, I feel that I don't know the, the solution. I, I mean, it's something that I want to devote my life's work to, but I don't know what the solution is. Um, uh, and it is tricky, you know, and, so, and one of the things, you, if, if, if a science-minded argument is injected with emotion, like say with global warming, that opens it up to people saying, see, they're biased, right? So there's a lot of problems with, with adding, an, uh, you know, squeezing some emotion into a science-driven story. Um, but, but I, and, and there's another huge problem. I, I found my the greatest kind of challenge is, is, is issues of taste. Um, and it's a very hard thing to kind of figure out exactly why is some, something tasteful and something not. So I was worried from the very beginning of, of the Fallen piece that so this is a, by definition, a distasteful piece of work. It's, it's talking about war with fancy graphics and figures, right? And, and so every time we're doing music, it's always just kind of laboring over, is this tasteful? And so I, again, I, it's, it, and it's very hard for me to even explain why some things seem tasteful and, and not. Um, and so it's, I think there's a lot of challenges. I mean, one thing I'll say though, is that, uh, is, is that in a lot of ways, this kind of split between the public and, and the, the you know, this, the expert and public opinion split isn't there. So I mean, it's, again, it's calling out the obvious, but there are people, there aren't a lot of people who think that the earth doesn't, the sun doesn't go around the earth or, 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 or the electricity is some kind of a demon or, um, yeah, and one of the, 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 the lines from the, the steel line from the upcoming documentary is that, is that there aren't people, people who are skeptical about the science of weapons, right? So the nuclear bomb, that's some crazy science, but no one's necessarily doubting it but we're skeptical about the science of peace, right? And so that's where this question of numbers really comes in is because is it's, the, it's, it's, the, you know, is it's the abstract is where, where there's this opportunity for, for the public to, to kind of, to, to, but there's this hope too because you know, there's a lot of examples where it's not happening. But I, I, yeah, I wish I had an answer for you. I'm working on it. Thank you. It's a little dangerous because I'm Neil's dad. And <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> I'm, swe I'm sweating right now. But, <laughs> but, but I saw The Fallen naturally a few times, admired it. But what I was going to say, and I was going to ask how many, how many people here saw The Fallen? Or, or it's 18. Oh, love it. Okay. D didn't. It, it, am I right in assuming that you felt a lot of strong emotion? Would 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 you? <laughs> this is the dad. This is the dad thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my emotion I felt when I saw it for the third time was on a larger screen. Was no more war. So, so I think in answer to the other. I think you, you, you have shown just one example of, of and that you were present in, in voice, which I think helped, you know, create some of the things you're talking about, that the presentation of it, the voice was important, <coughs> and I 
gave the emotions that you were trying to create. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's starting. Okay. <laughs> Mom, want to wave? <laughs> Can I, so, hi. Uh, so, I, I'm still staring at this point you have there, but I'd be overvaluing interactivity. And I'm, I'm thinking about what you just said earlier about how you don't want somebody to just like lay out all the materials and say, just, you know, explore, and I'm just gonna answer questions. I thought that that's a very interesting thought because, because I think, well, you're obviously right. I mean, I totally agree with that. But I think what we're also overvaluing here is the technology. It's like saying we can be interactive, so why wouldn't we, <laughs> but why would we not? But it's, it's like saying, well, we, we had this thing, photography, for a long time. Now we've got video. Video is more technology. It's better technology. So clearly, photography is dead. Nobody needs photography anymore. And, but that's clearly wrong. And so this, this whole idea of s stories not being as valued, and, and to, the, also to the earlier point about like, the, the impact that, that a well-done story can have, I think we're, we're sacrificing that because of technology, because we can be interactive. And I think that, that to me <laughs> seems like a really interesting little insight here. Um, I'm wondering if, you're <laughs> if that's what you were after. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, I, um, and it's interesting now to kind of follow what happens with, with VR, right? And I'm, ex and I'm excited about VR. I think that'd be kind of cool to try it out. But there is this, this thing of, is, is, is it like, you know, when you give that short, as a filmmaker, Pointing the camera is one of the best things you can do, and in VR, you're giving that up, you know. And so, a lot of folks who who experience VR, like like some of the New York Times ones, they, they, they think, well, I wish that they were telling me what to look at because I. And so, that often is the case is that, that that we, we think that technology is going to make something you know, solve problems, and it, you know. I mean, one thing I'll, I'll quickly say on, on that is that is that a lot of this idea about the story, the future of storytelling, and and I've heard folks say that yeah, people aren't getting into this interactive stuff so much, but it's because they have to, it's like literacy. We have to learn to like interactive content. And, and I just, that's something that I just think it's a, a kind of a really poisonous idea, because I, I feel that it's blaming the audience for, for not liking clicking on stuff enough, right? And, 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 so, I, and so I think there's this, there's this con, kind of this, 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 this lure to, 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 to kind of ha have technology solve problems that maybe it doesn't, doesn't really work as well. That's all? Oh, there we go. So I was just gonna maybe just reinforce or make a comment about Enrico's comment and your dad's comment, and I'll get my mom down here later and she can <laughs> praise me so we can have equal. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think what, what Neil did and what some of these other, you know, Periscopics piece did and the pitch piece on drones and even I'd say that the Tampa Bay Times piece did is that they touched on emotions that are particularly meaningful to us personally that touch us and, and mean things to us personally. And I think the challenge for probably everyone in this room is that every day we're making graphs and, and making points. I'm gonna avoid stories, but we're making graphs and, and, and giving presentations that may not be that way, right? It's a, it's a chart on GDP growth. It's, right. you know, even health insurance changes, you know, 12 million people lose or gain their health insurance. Like that shit's meaningful, but it's hard to really get it to, to deep into people's hearts. And so your point that it was so meaningful is, you know, emotion is a tricky and tricky in that way because things mean different things to different people. The chart I have in my slides for a talk next week is like the 50% decline in Tableau stock last year. Like all the Tableau people here are super sad about that, but there's like a couple of people who work for Click that are like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, but you know, so, so different things mean different things to different people. So I think we're all trying to figure out how to, how to make people care about the thing that we're talking about, which is not always as emotional as, as death and kids and, and education. So I, I don't know, I'm just rambling. <laughs> no, yeah, but I think I, that's true. I mean, and, and yeah, so like I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a thing on like World War II, which is, I mean, what's more emotionally, you know, it's an easy, it's an easy <laughs> place to find emotion. I mean, but I mean, but, but in the case of, of healthcare, so I think that, um, uh, Providing health to sick people, people being sick and people not being sick, there that is emotionally rich. I mean that that and so and so sometimes it's just a matter of and I feel like and, and I would love to work on a piece on, on healthcare and attack it from from that angle because 
and, and I feel like, but the problem is if you, if you were to say to somebody, hey, I want to do a piece on, on healthcare spending, and I really want to just come at it from this, showing the beauty of caring for sick people, there'll be some pushback saying, hey, it sounds like you're getting kind of like one-sided on this debate. Whereas to me, I, I don't think that's very controversial. I don't think when Hans Rosling is saying people are coming out of sickness, there's nothing controversial about that, right? But it, it's, that's kind of, I think, one of the, the battles is that, is, is, yeah, if you, do want to, if you do want to take the emotional side, it often feels like you're coming at it with a slant. Um, and, and again, I, I, don't, I don't have a solution. Um, one thing that comes to mind for me, and I don't know this gentleman's name who's sitting in front of me, Joe. Oh, John. Um, but when thinking about kind of the emotional aspects of data visualization, particularly in like a business application, um, which a lot of us work in, um, I was thinking a lot about the kind of that climax that, that Cole articulated. <coughs> um, and one of the things, one of the conversations I actually recently had with a client was, um, she, she said something to me like, your dashboards are really causing a stir around here uh, because they're, I they're identifying the hot leads that we have that haven't been reached out to or engaged, right? <laughs> Which is what the dashboards were supposed to do. Um, and it was kind of, it was kind of a funny um, conversation, right? Because she was like, yeah, our sales team is like spinning its wheels, trying to figure out like who's gonna reach out to these people and why they haven't been touched and everything. Um, and that is an emotional response, now that I'm considering it in that way. Right. Um, and I didn't set out to do that, and I had never really thought about data in, as an emotional experience before. Um, but even in a revenue generating sit, uh, situation, I think um, like maybe emotion needs to be there. Um, and this is a question that I don't have the answer to, but if emotion isn't part of a data story, and there's not that experience of being put in a difficult position or having some kind of emotional response to it, maybe it's not accomplishing what it needs to, and maybe it's not inspiring the action or changing people's thoughts or behaviors like it should. Um, and there are probably a host of examples of why that's not true, but that's just something I'm thinking <coughs> about right now um, based on what we've talked about today, so. Yeah, no, I, yeah, and so, I, and, and one thing to, to kind of play off that is, is with, especially these days with the political climate, a lot of times, even if the charts themselves don't have emotion in them, there's so much you know, frustration and anger that it's, it's kind of like, here's my unemotional chart, damn it. It's just like dripping with, you know, spit. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I think that, so I think there is, and so another, and that's, and, and so, and, and that's the case where you know, frustration and anger with, with the other side is a, emotion a lot of folks are feeling, and, and, and rightly so, but it's, that's, of all the most persuasive emotions, that's like the least persuasive one to use. Whereas you, if, you're, if, it, if there's any emotion reading this, any, any, any way you slice it, this is gonna be an emotional read on, on this political piece, right? So we might as well embrace the emotions which are more persuasive, which are more, you know, that get into kind of like the humans behind the story. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so I think to, to your point, a lot of times you don't think it's emotional, but there's, it, it's kind of surrounding it and, 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 or, or people are, you know, whispering it behind backs. Uh, hope. So uh, one thing that comes to mind is a, something I read a while ago about, um, it was by a linguist, and um, we're breaking down how people are expressing their, their especially young people are expressing themselves, and they, there's a shift that the linguists have identified from stating something as being something I think to something I feel. And um, so I'm just curious, as a storyteller versus someone who's receiving the information, I mean, what they pointed out was as soon as you start talking about I feel, then it's really hard to challenge that because there's no, it, you know, if that is what you feel, how can you, <coughs> you can't challenge someone's feelings, but you can challenge them on an intellectual basis if they say they think something. Right. So I think that's an interesting dichotomy that if you're telling something from the perspective of something that you feel versus the, here's what you think, and maybe the way I think about it is it makes you maybe have an emotion, that's different than starting it off by saying, I feel this way, and right away you're, in an interesting territory where you can't, no right. one can dispute that. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and I think <laughs> to that point, I'd, I'd say that I think there's a, danger, there's a lot of dangers in, and in, in kind of one of the, the, 
the point I was, I was trying to make is that that uh, because as, as said, that's a great example how there is there there's a problem with with extracting truth from from emotion right because uh, and and so I I think that even when you're telling stories that are emotional it's always important that the truth comes from the, 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 the scientific side. And so I think it's, it should be always adding emotion to that. Otherwise, you know, we have enough of these kind of, um, you know, altered truth realities happening. And so I'd, I, I'd hate to think that being emotional means that we're slipping more into this kind of gray area about what's, you know, feelings versus truth, but rather saying, let's always champion the scientific fact-driven realities but let's just, it's just, it's just expressing it, you know, and, and expressing it w with emotion on top of it. All right, thank you so much, Neil. <coughs> and thank you, thank you, yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh <-huh. coughs> and thanks, Ben, for running the, the show for most of the day, uh, in the, the, the short stories and, and the final keynote here. Don't run away quite yet, I have a few more final things to say, but <laughs> we're, we're almost at the end. So now it's time to get emotional. Um, 